All right. Um, today's lecture, I've titled it more about metallography because that's pretty much what it's about. And uh, we've seen uh, a bit about optical microscopy and some of the basic, basic principles behind an optical microscope. Um, we've also talked about differences between the microscopes used by a biologist, uh, which relies primarily on the transmission of light, and uh, what we use uh, in terms of an optical metallograph, or otherwise known as an inverted microscope, uh, which relies upon the light bouncing off of the surface. And as a metallurgist, the biggest thing about uh, optical microscopy or optical metallography in particular is the interpretation of microstructures and uh, what um, these things kind of mean. And uh, so uh, before we get too far into it, um, I've put together um, this uh, presentation or this lecture. Um, I based a lot of it on uh, these slides that were produced by Frauk Hoag. And uh, you can Google this gentleman. Um, there's a lot of uh, resources uh, put together by Frauk Hoag. Um, I acquired these slides several years ago at a TMS one day microstructure class. And uh, not to plug TMS or anything like that, but um, there are several uh, learning resources that they put out, and they're, they're oftentimes uh, pretty good. Um, so metallography, so this is uh, Frank Haug. A lot of these are his, his Frauk Haug, excuse me, a lot of his slides. Um, but he, what he has to say is uh, pretty spot on, and some of it overlaps uh, with the material that ended up in, uh, in my slides in the previous lecture in terms of the opinion. Um, so samples have to be prepared for examination, and we've seen a video on that. And if you've ever performed light optical uh, metallography, um, sometimes it can be very, very difficult, depending on the hardness or softness of the material. And it also depends on who's doing it. So different people will have different opinions. And uh, the world of optical metallography is really full of opinions. And so um, I think the best advice I can give you as a uh, future metallographer, if that is indeed your path in life, is um, do what works best for you. And uh, if someone gives you a skill or gives you a tip and it works for you, go ahead and use it. Um, if they tell you something and it doesn't work out, well, find something else. Because just like everything else, uh, there's pretty much more than one way to skin a cat, so they say. Um, so samples have to be prepared for examination. Um, typically, a highly polished surface, free from scratches and deformation is required. Uh, you don't want artifacts introduced into your specimen. And I'll have an example of an artifact that didn't come from the preparation, it came from the instrumentation in this lecture. And so uh, I, impl I implore you to pay attention, I'll point it out to you. Uh, microstructure is generally not visible in the as polished condition, and you typically have to etch. And we've talked a little bit about etching. Uh, we've talked about why etchants work the way they do in the previous lecture. And I like uh, the way that Frauk Haug um, summarizes it here. Um, so grain boundary etching, so only the grain boundaries are attacked by your etchant. And uh, so that'll behave differently than uh, the bulk. And we've talked about that a little bit. And grain surface etch, so each grain is attacked according to the grain orientation. Uh, you see a difference in color because they have a different associated surface energy. So it's actually really kind of cool. Um, this is interesting. So an etchant has to be selected according to the effect desired. And indeed, in a lot of uh, metallography handbooks, uh, there are some tips that tell you this is good for grain um, contrast and this is good for uh, grain boundary analysis, that kind of thing. Uh, so always look at your uh, reference as well and see what kind of information they're giving you. Um, so basic structures, so this is kind of a big deal. Um, we tend to speak a, a different language as metallurgists. And uh, so terminology used to describe microstructures, um, it's, it's, it's actually useful to have a common language. So when you write something down in an academic journal, journal excuse me, technical report, or you're just talking to your uh, metallurgy friends, uh, you know what each other is uh, talking about. And uh, you should be able to describe a structure. This is really interesting. So again, this is uh, the, the, the um, opinion of, of Frau Hogg. You should be able to describe a structure with words and someone else can draw the structure. And so this, this, this uh, person is very old school. And uh, so that's kind of interesting. I, I don't believe other than this, I have I ever come across with uh, being told I should be able to draw the structure. 
and uh, maybe I, I should uh, think about Barma's class back in the day. But anyway, basic structure, you should be able to, to describe it to someone else so they can draw it. Um, that's actually kind of cool. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, different types of structures here. And again, this is basic. Um, one thing before I go on, this may be a review for some of you. Um, I implore you to keep watching the lecture because it never hurts to see this stuff again. And if you've never seen this stuff before, well, pay attention. It's, it's always good to learn something new. And uh, the best way to um, increase your knowledge is to either read or do something. So um, those are maybe not the best way to phrase it today. But anyway, you learn by doing, uh, learn by reading. Um, this is kind of how it works. So single phase structure. So we're going to use these terms and uh, um, sometimes people use them interchangeably, but uh, we're going to talk about um, three examples of single phase structures. And a lot of the terminology actually was uh, coined by observing steel. And we talked about uh, Bain and uh, his uh, basically role in the creation of the inverted microscope. Uh, Bain was a, um, metallurgist that worked for U.S. Steel and uh, really um, um, started, well, I don't know if he, if he coined it, that's, that's very interesting. He was involved in the early days of, of um, characterization, if you will, of uh, microstructures via metallography. So here are some common words we use. So ferritic, austenitic, martensitic. Um, so ferrite, if uh, you remember, so the parent phase ferrite um, is alpha iron, so it's BCC. Alpha refers to the primary phase, uh, typically the one that's stable at room temperature. Um, it's a BCC structure. Um, we don't see any twins in this microstructure, and um, it's, it's magnetic. It's typically soft, and um, this is talking about uh, grounded grain boundaries, and um, so they're not jagged, and it's kind of nice. We see a triple point there, but um, this is kind of cool. I always like the history. So it's derived from the Latin word for iron, iron, which is ferrum, uh, which I guess you could kind of guess uh, based on the word ferrite that it's derived for the Latin word for iron. Um, anywho, it has a Brunel hardness value uh, from 100 to 250, um, according to this, uh, this slide. Um, so it's kind of interesting. This is kind of where it's, it's really important. And uh, so ferrite is a phase that you find in, in uh, typically the iron carbon uh, phase diagram. Um, if we have a microstructure that's ferritic, that means it looks like ferrite, but we see it in another material system. Okay, so that's the difference between ferrite and ferritic. And uh, this is CP tie and CP meaning Commercial, uh, commercial, commercially pure titanium. So this is pure tie. Um, so it's alpha titanium and uh, commercially pure tie. So again, we see kind of this similar structure, rounded grain boundaries and uh, no twins. Um, there's a little bit difference in the contrast uh, between uh, the, the steel version of steel based micrograph and the titanium based micrograph. But again, ferrite, ferritic, um, if it's ferritic, it's a microstructure that looks like ferrite, but we're finding it in another another material system. And no twins. I don't know if I read that off the slide for you guys. Austenite is gamma iron, so alpha, beta, gamma. So we know right away if it's not alpha, it's not the primary phase, it's gamma. Um, because it's a different phase of iron, we know it's not going to be BCC. Um, however, my useless trivia bug is calling to me, and I believe this is correct. Beta iron is no longer used um, by metallurgists as a distinct phase of iron. And I believe beta iron was non-magnetic BCC. I may be wrong, but beta iron is no longer used. Um, gamma iron or austenite is non-magnetic. Um, it has to be stabilized in some way by an alloying element. Um, angular grain boundaries is uh, what, what we're kind of looking at here. And you can kind of see there's an angle there. It's pretty sharp. It's not rounded. Um, and twinning is also something you see in austenite. Um, again, not stable at room temperature. Um, we have a Brunel hardness number between 100 and 400. 
and it's named after the English professor Sir Chandler Roberts Austin and uh, so Austinite and again I always like the history and, and uh, shout out the Frau Cog here for, for putting this information in here. Um, similar to what we saw between ferrite and ferritic, so austenite is the um, phase we see in steel. We see it in 316 stainless steel. Um, the alloying elements added to the stainless steel um, preserve this phase of iron at room temperature. So they stabilize the phase of iron at room temperature. Um, if we look at brass, we see a similar looking uh, microstructure. And so we would call this an austenitic microstructure because it looks similar to what we see in austenite. So again, we had ferrite, ferritic, austenite, austenitic. Um, again, these angular um, grain boundaries, so these kind of sharp angles and also twins. And so we see twinning here and here in the uh, microstructure. Uh, martensite, so martensite needles, and there's plate and lath martensite. That was always something I, I enjoyed for some reason when I learned about it. Um, it has its own uh, microstructure or its own crystal structure, excuse me. It has its own microstructure, needle-like microstructure. The crystal structure is BCT, and it forms with rapid cooling. And um, if I'm correct in remembering, this would be referred to as alpha prime martensite. And cools with rapid cooling, very hard, so we associate martensite with hardness, and uh, the hardness depends on the carbon content. So if we have 0.10% carbon, we have a Rockwell C number of 38. Higher um, carbon content, the Rockwell C number is 65. And uh, this is named after the German professor Adolf Martens and uh, I need to make my own phase, I think. But anyway, body-centered centered tetragonal structure, needle-like. We preserve this crystal structure at a cold temperature by quenching, or room temperature by quenching, and uh, we associate it with hard, and um, you definitely have to temper it for it to be useful, or else it's brittle, right? So i um, trying to remember my own days in, in intro. Uh, but anyway, martensite, here's uh, what it looks like. This actually seems to have a lot of texture in this image. It's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, maybe it's because it's, it's such a high mag. And so we see the effect of eating away the uh, metal a little bit by the etchant. Uh, martensite, so this is kind of a classical representation. Uh, we get lath martensite with a lower carbon content, so it's a bit softer. And plate martensite with a higher carbon content, so it's harder. So lath and plate. Um, don't want to forget uh, these things or uh, Varma will get you. Um, again, we have martensite, so seen in steel. This is 8740 grade steel and martensitic. So we see martensitic like microstructures in a 6 4 tie. And this is again this needle like um, structure. Uh, martensitic is uh, alpha prime titanium. And uh, so it's, it's not beta in this case, and I'll show some pictures of beta and you can kind of see the difference. Uh, but we know this is alpha prime just because of the morphology. It's this kind of needly microstructure. So it's martensitic because it looks like martensite. Uh, martensite, we always associate it with a needle, kind of elongated like microstructure. Um, so two phase structures, we're kind of focusing a bit on uh, iron carbon phase diagram uh, generated kind of materials uh, today. Um, so ferrite and perlite, alpha and beta, and a eutectic slash eutectoid. Um, if you remember the difference between eutectic and eutectoid, eutectoid is uh, when it's solid. So that means that what was liquid at the eutectic point has cooled to a solid at room temperature. So that's a eutectoid. Um, so ferrite and perlite, very common um, microstructure. And uh, so looking ahead, sorry, ferrite, perlite, alpha, beta, eutectic, eutectoid, ferrite and perlite microstructure. Uh, the ferrite is, is white, uh, the perlite is the darker. Uh, we see this in a, in a medium carbon steel. Um, if you remember what perlite is, it's a lamellar um, microstructure composed of ferrite and cementite. Uh, ferrite's generally the lighter phase when we look at uh, iron carbon uh, micrographs. Um, takes a little bit of time to form, um, slow cooling rate, um, 
changes uh, the hardness and um, also the spacing of the laths, the, the lamellae, if you will. And uh, I always thought this came from a beer. That's always the joke, but the name derives uh, from the mother of pearl uh, appearance that it, uh, it, it exhibits. Um, so again, perlite lamellar structure, and uh, there's a lot of cool um, stuff in the metal world. And I remember very distinctly um, the story of Damascus swords. And so they'll uh, get this lamellar structure on the Damascus swords. And I should, I should maybe find one of those and, and show an example. A very beautiful work, a very beautiful um, uh, metal smithing. Um, but anyway, we see it. Um, on the sword because it has this kind of cool microstructure two different phases so ferrite cementite ferrite is iron cementite is fe3c um, so it's chemically different so it'll react with the etching differently so that's why we see it um, really really kind of cool cool stuff perlite um, alpha and beta and so this is a 60 40 brass so alpha and beta uh, we're talking about two different phases here. And so it's a little bit different than the alpha and beta. And I'll give another example of alpha and beta um, that we've seen before. But alpha brass is a copper rich brass. Beta brass, or the phase, is a copper rich phase. Beta brass is, or beta phase is a zinc rich phase. And then we see a difference when we etch it. And this is actually, uh, I believe, a color camera that took this. And so it's not uh, white and black this time. So contrast is a little bit different um, than we typically uh, experience. I've said it before, I say it again. A lot of the interpretation of this stuff is looking at the differences between black and white. Uh, right now, we're looking at the differences between lighter and darker. Um, but alpha, beta, I'll, I'll talk about this again. So beta and alpha uh, can also be um, due to crystallographic structure. So we've talked about this a little bit before. Um, so we have alpha, it's, it's white, surrounded by beta, black. So this is 6,4 titanium. Um, the aluminum stabilizes the alpha phase and the vanadium stabilizes uh, the beta phase. So beta exists after, I wanna say the beta transits of titanium is about 760. You can look that up, see if I'm right or wrong. Um, you add vanadium in there to stabilize the beta, um, but you put the aluminum in there to make sure that everything doesn't turn in the beta. Okay, so you want an alpha beta um, microstructure or alpha beta composition. Yeah, I guess alpha beta microstructure is the right thing to say. And so we have um, alpha and beta. Uh, again, both are titanium. Alpha is, of course, hexagonal closed packed, whereas the beta phase of titanium is a body centered cubic. Okay, so there's differences in the crystallographic structure. And again, both are tied, this was etched. Uh, one thing I wanna point out on this one, and, uh, and I'll show you the publication that I was a part of this, so I'm actually almost kind of embarrassed, but these are artifacts. So if you go and look at the article, you'll see that these are artifacts, particularly for, for sure this one, and uh, there was the camera was, was dirty or damaged in some way. And uh, so they appear on every micrograph in this article, and it's kind of embarrassing. I, 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 uh, I've noticed this before, and I noticed it again when I was putting together this lecture. And uh, it's a kind of embarrassing. Um, so always try to be careful uh, when you're making uh, figures and stuff like that for publications, because they're there forever on Google. Um, so this is the paper it came from. I, I believe we put it out, yeah, five years, in 2015. Oh, actually, we submitted it in 2014. Okay, so anyway, a little bit older work. Maybe I was not as smart as I am now. Probably the opposite. Um, but alpha uh, surrounded by, by black. And uh, so the beta phase kind of segregates to the grain boundaries of uh, the alpha. Uh, this is another. And so this is Martin Siddick Alpha Prime. And uh, you can see the difference in the morphology with, I'm um, using my hand, I should be using the laser pointer, um, with uh, this alpha beta microstructure. Um, it's still a dark phase, okay? And uh, it occurred because of the transformation from beta to alpha. So there is some energy driving force transforming beta to alpha, but it didn't go straight up to alpha. It went to uh, Martin Siddick alpha prime, which has, again, the needle-like Martin structure. And uh, this came from 
this journal and we'll refer to this journal uh, quite often and I'll, I'll have it posted um, for you all to read um, because I think it's actually a good example of using several microscopy techniques together to tell a story. Um, eutectic slash eutectoid. And so again, it's a mixture of two phases forming at one temperature, um, ideally the eutectic point. When you solidify it, it becomes a eutectoid. And a perlite is one a solder. It didn't say which solder. Um, it could be a lead tin. Um, for all I know, I don't have that information on this slide. And aluminum silicon. And so we have uh, two, two phases, eutectic, eutectoid. Um, See this with metallography, you have chemical differences uh, between these two phases. So the one I will talk to the most is perlite. So perlite, we have these lamellar. Um, ferrite's the white phase. Uh, cementite's the black phase. Ferrite is pure iron. The black phase is Fe3C. So they chemically, they're different. Um, here and here, two phases, chemically different from one another. Um, in solder, um, there's either a, a tin-rich phase or a lead-rich phase, and um, or if it's tin bismuth, there's a tin-rich phase and a bismuth-rich phase, so it could go either way. Kind of looking at other uh, techniques, right, because metallography gives us information, and uh, you can actually see chemically defined phases uh, via the SEM, and uh, so this is uh, eutectic solder, this is tin bismuth, and uh, but crystal crystallographic phases can be somewhat observed, and so metallography um, is both. And so this is with a backscatter electron detector. And when we start talking about electron microscopy, um, I will uh, we'll talk about backscatter electrons a lot. But backscatter um, microscopy on a SEM allows you to get kind of similar information that you can get from optical microscopy or optical metallography. And there is an advantage that you don't have to prep the material or prep the specimens to a mere finish um, when you're looking at phase characterization. Uh, to get something like this, uh, you need to have two distinct chemistries in each of your phases. However, I've been doing a little bit of research on, uh, on some stuff and I came across this. So they, they didn't polish it at all. Um, they threw their specimen into uh, the microscope and this is 6,4 titanium. And uh, so they can actually see the different phases. And uh, so that's actually kind of cool. I, I, I want to look at it a little bit more critically before I say they were right, but um, it's published. So somebody agreed that they were right. Anyway, so you can actually see phase contrast. And uh, I believe this is done with a secondary electrons. Okay, and we'll talk about the difference between secondary and backscatter electrons when we get in the SEM and I'm taking this big segue and I probably shouldn't. Um, this was taken with backscatter electrons. This was taken with secondary electrons. So there's a surface, a surface morphology difference on these that's allowing uh, the investigator to see the differences between phases. And so they're showing the alpha lath here and we're saying that the um, beta forms on the kind of the interface or, or the grain boundary, if you will, of uh, these alpha grains. And so beta is forming here. Um, this alpha prime's a little bit wonky for me to say it's alpha prime, but they're saying it's alpha prime. They're claiming they're getting uh, metallographic-like phase information off of secondary electrons. So just know that this is out there. And uh, when we talk about um, scanning electron microscopy, we'll talk about which is better um, in, uh, in this class as, as the semester progresses. Um, this, this one came from a different article. So this was an electron backscatter diffraction study um, for uh, EBM actually. So 6,4 um, um, aluminum. And uh, they did electron backscatter diffraction. So these are secondary electron images and these are electron backscatter diffraction images. And, and I freely admit that this stuff belongs in the SEM section. I have it here because I'm showing that they're getting metallographic like information uh, and actually a little bit more because the backscatter diffractometry tells you the orientation of the grains. And so the BCC would be the alpha, I'm sorry, the beta phase, the HCP would be the alpha phase. So you're actually getting the orientation of these different grains. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually a little bit more powerful uh, than metallography. So um, that's just an opinion though. So I'll let you guys decide which you think is the, is the better tool. Again, same article. <laughs> 
Um, so other uh, terminologies that we tend to talk about, so grain shape and size, and so we're jumping back to the optical metallography part um, after my little segue into saying, hey man, you can get similar information on an SEM, is it better? Um, I will tell you very plainly that the instrument that made the images of the SEM very, very much more expensive, a backscatter diffractometer by itself is like a hundred K. That's not counting the microscope. That's the auxiliary unit you put on the microscope. So uh, that alone advantaged my metallography actually, because uh, it's a little bit less expensive to acquire the equipment set for metallography. Um, anywho, Again, words of Frank, Frauk, I always call him Frank, but it's Frauk Hogg, it's probably Frauke. I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong. I didn't mean to butcher his name, but giving him credit. Um, the words of Frauk Hogg, so equiax grains, um, they're typically annealed. Anything done with cold working is removed and the grains are essentially round. Why? Because the annealing process put energy into the system. The material tried to lower its system so what did it do? Well, the grains formed as close to a circle as they could. And uh, if you look at, and I'll say this before, I'll say it again, perhaps, maybe I haven't said it before. If you look at artist depictions of grain structure, they're always like a honeycomb. And that's because it's the um, closed packed structure, the easiest way to pack a structure together without having gaps in between. So that's why grains uh, essentially, ideally want to look like a honeycomb. So it's kind of cool. And I'll show images later on in this class of dislocation arrays that have formed themselves into a honeycomb-like structure. Very, very cool. So we have equiax grains, we have elongated grains. Uh, typically we associate elongation with cold working. Um, when you cold work something, you make it harder and stronger. And uh, it's kind of uh, speaks for itself, I guess. Grains are elongated in the direction of working. Um, so equiax, is, we typically think of equiax, equiax grains as softer. Again, essentially round. Um, equiax, so how do we determine if a microstructure is equiax? So we have a uh, ferrite and austenite. So we have ferrite that has uh, the rounded grains. We have austenite that has the kind of angular grains. Um, however, if we kind of take a survey of the dimensions in two dimensions, so it's, this looks like orthogonal to one another, they're roughly the same size. So we'd say this is equiax. This is a little stretched out, but if you did a survey on uh, the ratio here to the ratio here of these grains, you'd probably find that they are all pretty similar. So that's an equiax microstructure. Um, elongated microstructure has some sort of an aspect ratio. And uh, so this is ferrite again, and uh, this is austenite. And uh, so we see that there's one dimension that's definitely longer than the other. So this is what we would call an elongated grain. Um, uniform grain size kind of speaks for itself. All the grains are roughly the same, roughly the same size. Um, but some can have an aspect ratio, and um, but uniform grain size. Duplex grain size, um, two distinct grain sizes that can be measured. And so you can see there's these kind of little baby grains amongst these bigger grains. I'm curious what this actually is. Maybe this is duplex steel. They didn't uh, identify what it was and I'm failing my own identify the microstructure test, but duplex grain size. Uh, mixed grain size uh, kind of speaks for itself. So some very large grains and a mix of smaller grains. I'll go on a limb and say this is austenite. And uh, so we have kind of this multi-grained uh, structure, perhaps due to the processing sides, uh, processing uh, parameters. Perhaps this part here is hotter. So it had a longer time for the grains to grow. Uh, grain growth is kind of an interesting thing. And there's statistical models of grain boundaries defeating one another. Uh, as a solidification process occurs. Just food for thought. Um, distribution of phases is the next uh, topic Mr. Hogue um, presents to us. So uniform banding and clusters. And so uniform, um, very similar to what we saw with uniform grain size. So spread out pretty even. There's no phase segregation. Um, banding, uh, you have bands of, of carbon rich. So there's perlite and carbon poor ferrite. So pure iron versus 
uh, something that's a mixture of iron and, and cementite uh, banding due to the processing most likely. And uh, clusters, so areas of ferrite and areas of perlite. So now you have these clusters. And uh, this is really cool. I, I really like the reveal on the next slide as to what's going on. Uh, so this was some sort of billet that I'm assuming was rolled. Maybe I'm wrong, but it was processed in some way. So we, we talk of things in terms of transverse and longitudinal. So longitudinal is along the length of, of it could be a rolled bar. And transverse is, is when we're uh, looking at, at the cross section, basically. And so you see you have clusters on the transverse and bands on the longitudinal. And putting everything together in the big picture is, is kind of cool. It's very important. Um, I would always call these metallography cubes. This is more of a metallography rhombohedron, maybe. Um, but when you do that, you can aid in your characterization efforts. And we'll see some more examples of this very shortly. Uh, process influence on microstructure, it makes a big difference. And I think we learned that from day one of um, metallurgy school, should I, for lack of a better term. And uh, so cast, so this is kind of the classical cast microstructure. And uh, this is a cast ingot, and this is a macro etch. And a macro etches can be uh, um, kind of dirty business sometimes. And so I used to work in a steel mill and I wasn't, it wasn't aluminum, it was steel. And I used to boil slices of steel billets and a mixture of sulfuric acid. And uh, I believe it was a mixture of sulfuric and nitric, uh, but sure it was acid. And I had to go out and do it in this kind of remote fume hood and it was, it was it's scary business heating up acid for me anyway and uh, this i'm not quite sure how the macro etching of aluminum was performed but i'm imagining it was in a similar way and uh, you have to immerse it so this isn't uh, metallography per se uh, but it, you're still revealing the microstructure uh, by applying a chemical etchant and uh, so this is a cast aluminum microstructure um, we typically associate um, dendrites are a dendritic microstructure with, uh, with casting. So this is white cast iron. And uh, so perlite dendrites, and then we had uh, iron, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, cementite in the interdendritic spaces is, is what, uh, what this is saying, if I can actually read the whole slide. And uh, so perlite dendrites, and we have cementite in uh, the interdendritic spacing. And uh, so lamellar structure, and uh, then we have cementite in the interlamellar structure. So cool. Um, I tend to say this, we associate dendrites with slow cooling because we see dendrites in other manufacturing processes other than casting sometimes, uh, namely additive manufacturing. And um, so we've seen dendrites in um, other material systems and other um, material processing techniques. So route material, um, so worked material is called route. And uh, so working uh, can be done by forging. Uh, hot working takes place above the recrystallization temperature. So that's going to vary depending on the material system you're working with. Cold working takes place below the recrystallization temperature. Um, so when you're cold working a material, oh, you can also have dynamic recrystallization occur. Um, but that's another story. And uh, flow lines can be made visible. Uh, I think this is a typo. It should be both processes. And uh, by flow lines, uh, you see this on the steel forging macro etch, and it's actually really cool um, flow lines. So it kind of gives you an idea of how this was made. If I cut this in half and etched it, and it looked like this aluminum block, excuse me, this aluminum block, we could say it was cast. But we actually see now, based on the macro etching, that there is some material flow occurring during the manufacturing process. And so this is a macro etch. Um, so hot worked. And so the direction of working um, can be determined by the direction of inclusions. And so that's interesting how these defects are actually telling us how it was worked. And so this is a hot rolled carbon steel. and. This is, would take a really trained eye, I'll be honest with you, um, to see 
what's going on here. But if I look at this, I'm assuming this stuff's inclusions. I may be wrong, to be honest with you, but there seems to be some linearity if you look at it hard enough. And uh, so Mr. Hogue here is saying that's the direction of rolling. Here it's a little bit more obvious. We see an inclusion here, an inclusion here, an inclusion here. And so we know the rolling kind of occurred in this direction. Inclusion, inclusion, here's like stringers of inclusions, actually. Um, so that's telling us the, the direction of the, of the working. And so this is hot-headed in Canel. So this wasn't rolled. Um, hot-headed, if uh, you don't know, um, the term hot is telling us that it was heated above the recrystallization temperature. It's hot-headed because, let's say, it's typically a bar, a steel bar, and they heat up the top of it to above the recrystallization temperature and start slamming a die on it. And if you've never been in one of these forging operations, um, give it a try. Because if you ever complain about your job, a lot of times uh, these things, particularly making like sucker rods for uh, oil pumps, it's a, it's a person holding the piece of steel in this giant two-story hammer. And so if you're ever having a bad day about your job, um, nothing against these people that are doing the forging. I, 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 my heart goes out to metal workers, uh, but some jobs are more easier on the body, so to speak, than others. So nothing against these people. Uh, but anyway, um, hot-headed again, the steel bar, you heat it up at the top, boom, 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 bash a die on it to make whatever you're making. Um, I, I dare say this was this potentially was hot-headed, uh, maybe, yeah, based on, on the way it looks with this flange and everything. Um, anywho, Cold worked, so cold war, cold rolled um, steel sheet. Um, this is telling me there's some badness going on in, in this material. There, there's going to be some bad days here at their quality control. Uh, but anyway, the grains are elongated uh, due to the, 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 the rolling. Uh, this is warm headed austenitic stainless steel, so it's still heated up, uh, but it's not heated up quite to the recrystallization temperature when before that big hammer that big hammer comes down. Um, anyway, casting, if uh, I forgot to put a picture of myself casting, but uh, I do a lot of metal casting. So anyway, cold work. So metal additive manufacturing is um, kind of the last process we're gonna take a look at, namely uh, electron beam melting and selective laser melting. And uh, I got this figure out of, uh, again, the same review, and I'll post this whole paper for you guys to read it. Um, I think it's a good example. There's several others. There's a billion papers now, uh, and I don't think that's an exaggeration, to be honest with you. A uh, billion papers written about this type of stuff now. And uh, so this is electron beam melter. Um, electron beam used as it works in a vacuum. And uh, so it uses an electron beam similar to what we use with a microscope, only uh, it has a higher energy, so you can actually melt the material. And the ability of an electron beam to melt a material um, ends up being a test question on an XRD, so we'll will kind of foreshadow there. Um, selective laser melting uses a laser, as you might expect, but you have an inert gas atmosphere, so either argon or nitrogen um, is used. Uh, they're both gravity fed. If, uh, if this doesn't tell you that it is, um, actually, excuse me, the EBM's gravity fed, so you have these two hoppers that feed the material. Here you have an elevator with a vat of powder and the elevator direction um, moves down actually as the material is built and the excess powder is dumped into this chamber. And uh, excuse me, made that little mistake. Uh, but anyway, key differences, electron beam operates in a vacuum. Um, laser beam operates in an inert gas atmosphere. Uh, there are people that have done a lot of experimentation purging helium into an EBM during the cooling stage to try to change the microstructure that way. Uh, but how do we observe the microstructure of an EBM and SLM fabricated parts? Well, good old fashioned metallography. And uh, here's some examples. Um, again, all the metal additive manufacturing images I'm gonna show you on the subsequent slides come from this article. Okay, so I wanna give them credit. Um, so this is from that same article, EBM of copper and uh, it was actually an interesting story. If you read the article, oxygen actually got into the system somehow and uh, formed these copper precipitates. And so that's what you're seeing here is copper precipitation. Um, you're creating kind of this elongated structure. The arrow corresponds to the build direction. 
So longitudinally, you see this kind of alignment, these almost columnar structure. Um, kind of on the top, you see um, some kind of weirdness in terms of, the, of how things nucleated. And then at the very top, you see the tops of these columns. Um, it always kind of bothered me a tad how the side structure never really matched up. But anyway, purpose of this is they're using optical microscopy, optical metallography to, to characterize the microstructure. Um, this is Inconel 625. This is made also with EBM, and we see the same uh, kind of effect here, this kind of columnar microstructure and a difference when we look at the transversal uh, cross-section. And uh, so, so it's kind of cool. Again, this so-called metallography cube, even though it's not always a cube. Um, this is, again, from the same article. Um, this is, again, in Canel uh, 625, but we're, we're doing SLM. And I want to kind of point out this kind of feature here. And uh, the magnification is a little bit different. OK, so it's higher on this one. So things appear bigger. Um, there are some microstructural differences between EBM and SLM, and I'll invite you to read the paper um, if you're uh, really, really interested. But again, using light optical microscopy, uh, the key difference I want to point out is this, these little kind of curvy lines. Um, if we look at these, uh, again, now we're looking specifically at selective laser melting. This is the same Inconel 625 uh, micrograph or metallographic cube um, that's been made different um, micron markers. So this is a much higher magnification than this one. Again, we want to point out these little lines and you see these lines again here on this microstructure. This is 17.4 uh, precipitation, precipitation hardened stainless steel or 17.4 pH stainless steel. Um, these little lines here are, are kind of what I'm trying to point out on the kind of last couple of slides. And those lines are melt pool artifacts. And so when the laser comes down and hits the powder bed, it creates a, a pool of molten metal. And so we still see that even after the processing is done. And so uh, these melt pools, so if I asked you, man, is this router cast or additively manufactured? If you see this melt pool, um, sometimes you can see melt pools in EBM as well. So it's enough to know that it's additively manufactured. Um, difference uh, between route and cast. So anyway, these melt pool artifacts, again, when the beam hits, it creates a pool of molten metal. And so we're kind of seeing this leftover artifact on these uh, micro micrographs. Failure analysis. And uh, I always like pictures of boats broken in half for <laughs> failure analysis. Um, I think Stafford used to show similar pictures, I think, at, at, uh, in his class as well. Um, and he probably still does. And uh, so the SS Schnecht Hattie, I got this uh, from this Offbeat Oregon webpage of uh, this boat broken in half, and, and this was due to uh, poor welding um, and, and a mixture of temperature gradients so fractured this boat. So used in failure analysis, and so the title actually should say metallography is used in failure analysis. And if you've taken failure analysis, I know so, several of you have, you have far better examples than I'm gonna show, uh, but this is, again, a refresher. Um, so gas porosity, here would be an example of gas porosity. So there is gas somehow in the molten material, um, typically characterized by a round shape because the gas formed a bubble, trying to lower its energy. Um, shrinkage porosity, a little bit different. So we have a morphology kind of following the parent microstructure is how I always would describe it. Um, I liked his description really better. Voids at the interdendritic spaces. So this would be in a casting and uh, insufficient molten material and would be the cause of this and good old-fashioned cracks so you've probably seen a lot of this in, in various failure analysis examples uh, this is an unetched specimen very cool as polished so this may be one of the few microstructural features you can see in metallography uh, without etching your specimen and uh, here's an example of stress crows and cracking so we've etched the specimen and I believe this is, a, is austenitic steel, um, stress corrosion cracking, and uh, transgranular, generally transgranular. And you can see, I mean, this is a really good example of transgranular cleavage, so to speak. Maybe I'm using the word too liberally. Uh, Frau Hoag, again, uh, providing these, these slides um, through it. So stress corrosion cracking, another classic example of using uh, metallography in uh, Failure analysis, again, trans, I'm sorry, yes, transgranular cracking. 
Um, so kind of a summary, summarize this, and there's a bigger world. Uh, there's several other microstructures you can look at, whether it's welding, soldering, uh, you know, microstructures of joined metals is, is actually another thing uh, that you can look at. Uh, this is just a little bit, um, kind of the tip of the iceberg of, of, of things you can do with metallography. Uh, but metallography is a powerful tool for the metallurgist and the interpretation of the microstructures is key to its usefulness. So you kind of got to know what you're looking at or else you went through a lot of trouble to polish and etch your specimen for nothing. And one thing uh, I've talked about since the class began um, experience is a big deal in the interpretation of the data that comes off your uh, um, characterization equipment, whether it's a scanning electron microscope, x-ray diffractometer, or light optical micrograph. So uh, this comes with experience. And so always keep striving to learn is, is uh, the best advice I can give you there. And again, as always, thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully this has been useful and informative to you all. Thank you. Oh my, it's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.